<coughs> Alright, so today we're going to be looking at the Ethereum virtual machine. So, everything that happens on an Ethereum contract happens because it's executing uh, computer code. And the virtual machine is very similar to um, a CPU in that it gets passed byte code, and those byte code uh, dictate everything that you can do with the contract. Uh, so they sort of start off here in the yellow paper talking about the execution mode. Um, so the state gets changed by every transaction and the concept is you have a state after one block then you've got a block that's got a list of transactions and they change the state to the new state. Um, this state is altered by a series of bytecode instructions and environmental data. Um, this is specified through the virtual machine, known as the e Ethereum virtual machine, and it's a quasi Turing complete machine. Um, they call it quasi because um, they add this concept of gas, which limits what you can do, um, just because the whole idea of a Turing compute a complete machine, you can't tell if the program will fully execute or if it will end in a um, infinite loop. So to prevent that, they just put in this thing called gas. And that's why they can't reuse any other languages. They, um, they need this unique concept, which is you can only execute up to a certain net. You can only spend so much. Um, because an infinite loop is not allowed at all. And they start talking here about the virtual machine, simple stack-based architecture. So it's pretty much, it revolves around this stack, and a stack's just an array, if you like to think of it. Um, they just put an item onto the array, and they take stuff off the array, and it grows and shrinks as it needs. Um, And then, the, what happens is, in the code, in the core folder, in VN, there is all the stuff relating to the virtual machine. Um, and this one here, the evm.go, is really the overlying um, structure that takes the code and runs it really. Um, I want to specifically look at a new contract creation because uh, this is quite a big file and it's got different a lot of different things going on in it. But they start by defining the usual empty things. Um, here are some signatures, functions that don't actually have any bodies. Um, that's just expected that you'll be able to call them. Um, so the Ethereum virtual machine can run a contract. Um, we'll probably look at that later because um, I want to look at creating a contract. Um, first of all, it defines a context, um, and this is mostly just what's going on in the block before um, anything gets executed. So it's got like the gas limit in the block, um, who the fees are going to, um, yeah, difficulty block number. Here they define the structure relating to the virtual machine, which takes that context. It has the database, which is all the state. Um, a config file, 
the interpreter, which is what they'll use to call all the code. Um, and yeah, first of all, they define a new virtual machine, which is just the parsing context, parsing a database, parsing the configs. Um, and it will give you a VM virtual machine, which I think they only would do once every time you start up the uh, the get software. Um, some boring stuff relating to operation, killing that. Um, call. This is um, if there is an existing um, contract on the blockchain, you can pass some input, which is um, an array of bytes and it will use the address and that address is expected to be the um, to be the contract on the blockchain and it will send that input to there so it's it's where you're calling functions of a contract that's already on the blockchain um, we won't go through that because we'll do that some other time call code here they've mentioned something the same, but um, but different. Not sure yet. Gonna skip over that. Delegate call, which I imagine is not calling it straight away. Static call. Um, these are calls that you don't actually send to the. Um, blockchain but you can call them and they'll give you a result anyway so it's like if you've got a contract function that does a two times two you don't need to run that in the context of a blockchain um, because you can just get the result straight away and it's not going to cost you any gas because you can you end up doing it on your computer anyway it's your computer processing it um, code and hash structure this is where below creates here, um, you pass the code and the hash. So this is going to be the contract code and this is going to be the hash of the contract code. Um, this is if the hash doesn't exist, you can get the hash and it will also save it takes the C code, kick at 256 hash, saves it in it, and also returns it. Um, and here, we end up with the contract creation code. So, here, you get your virtual machine. And this virtual machine's been set up with all the oper operation codes and all those things defined elsewhere. Um, when you create a new contract, you can be creating a new stack, you're gonna be creating a new memory space and all that stuff. Um, and you're executing the code and the hash, which is that structure that was just there before. Um, this is the person calling it. Um, and I'm not sure if this gas is either gas price or if it's how much gas it has to use. Um, I'm sure we'll see in a second. So, if we go to remix Ethereum, You can create contracts um, let's tests in Solidity. And Solidity um, is a programming language that can be compiled down into um, a 
into bytecode, which is read on the Ethereum virtual machine. There were a few languages originally. Um, Solidity just, just has become the big one. And I guess because it reads a lot like Python. And it's just a lot easier to understand. Um, any proposal vote start to compile phase analysis um, cool so the way a contract works in solidity basically I'm not an expert but um, the overarching contract you have some structures and in it Constructor. See, this is, I always thought it was just called ballot, like function ballot, and that's your constructor. But here they've got constructor. They actually explicitly say this is the constructor, constructor of the contract. So when you pass the contract code to the virtual machine, it'll execute this on the first time, which initiates. In this case, it's um, a voting ballot. So you want a chairman. Um, and then you want a bunch of proposals that you've voted on. Um, don't want to dig too much into this, but it's like, you know, you've got the constructor, you've got a bunch of functions which people outside of the contract can call. And, you know, the um, chairperson can give the right to vote, or that a voter can give a proxy. So it's, a, it's that sort of thing. Um, a bunch of functions can be executed by people. When you compile this ballot, you get some bytecode here, and I think that we go over here. Um, let's code.evm thin byte um, mm -hmm. so that is the byte code there for the whole contract Unfortunately, it's structured a bit gross, so we can't see it easily. I wonder if there's a um, EVM byte code viewer. Uh, I don't know, the reverse engineering stuff. Disassembler looks like. Um, Debugger testing. So this is what it's given us. Um, link references. These are going to be links to external contracts which are to be included. Um, the object I imagine is actually like the um, that this is encoded as a number, so you can copy and paste that into um, into a computer and then decode that and that'll give you the opcodes. But here's the actual opcodes here. Um, copy.
Yeah. This is going to give me a nice, nicely formatted thing. But you can see. Uh, code here. Compiled into bytecode. Bytecode starts with some stuff to set up the stack. Um, and it pretty much is unreadable from a human point of view. Unless you've been doing it for years. And you're a God's gift to computers. Um, so, this bytecode gets passed to the virtual machine create code. Um, the person calling it, so the account that's making it. Um, the code is put into this code and hash and um, gas price and stuff is sent along. So they check some stuff here to make sure that that's even possible. Um, you know, there might be insufficient funds. The sender can't actually do what they want us. Like if they, you have to set up contract, you have to pay for it. Um, and if they can't pay for it, then they don't get it. And getting the nonce, so they go into the caller's address, getting the um, getting the nonce that's currently for their account and making a new one being nonce plus one. Um, ensure there's no existing contract to this address. Um, yeah, they're just making sure you're not putting something that already exists. Um, and you create a new account. And the new account is all the information for that contract. Um, so create an account with this new address can't do it if it's already there, it doesn't add inclusion. Um, here they're checking EIP15A. EIP15A. State clearing. For all blocks where the block is greater than four block number, Yeah, okay, so this is back on that um, person who created so many empty accounts. And they're just testing that um, uh, if it's got a nonce of zero, it'll be deleted. Um, and whenever you touch the address, it checks that the um, um, it checks that the account's actually got stuff going on it. And if it's an empty account, it'll delete it. So I guess originally they probably would have set all the nonces to zero. After that spam attack they now set them all as one um, straight away they transfer money from the caller's address to the contract address for the value so this value here must be how much ethereum you're putting onto the contract and that's what the contract has to use when it sets itself up. So making a new contract with the caller, um, the account reference as the address, the value and the gas. Um, setting the hash, so this is now, they've created the actual contract and then they're gonna 
probably go through the contract or they'll call an interpreter with that contract over it or something I said um, if it's debug um, they set up a tracer if the debug is on so they can dig through what's actually going through it um, and the tracer I think actually spits out a big JSON of every step that the Ethereum machine goes through. So it starts off with a state that's blank, executes one bytecode, one of these, and then prints out the state after that and how much gas is used at each step. And I think it's meant to be just so like debugging contracts is so hard that you need to be able to go through them um, line by line. 